So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this closing symposium, a sponsored symposium of PCR London Val 2018. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here. The last 12 months, at least, has seen renewed uh, focus on the challenges of mitral and tricuspid valve intervention. And these months have also seen emerging data relating to the cardioband device for both mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. So it's a great pleasure to co-chair this session with Francesco Mezzano and to sit in the midst of such a distinguished panel. Francesco is going to provide some opening remarks to set the scene. Francesco. Thank you, Bernard. <clears throat> so uh, here are my conflict of interest for the session. The session objectives of the day are to understand how patients with valve regurgitation and annual dilatation can benefit from cardioband system, to learn how to treat the unmet needs of patients with tricuspid valve disease, and to learn how to select the right patients for this system. So without uh, losing more time on the introductions, I'd just like to uh, show you the, uh, the, the, the schedule of the day of, the, of this uh, session. We will go through what is the system, what's new, tricuspid, what are the challenges we have? Maurice Serrano is really giving us an amazing overview. And then we will go through the more technical parts and finally identifying the right patient for cardiac system. So having said that, I would like to move forward and invite here Azim to talk about the cardiac mitral system. What is new? Thanks, Francesco uh, and Bernard. So I'll take you a little bit <clears throat> through CardioBand. Uh, a lot of you know CardioBand. Uh, it started first for the mitral system, but you know, let's go through it from the beginning and talk a little bit about the importance of mitral regurgitation. These are my conflicts of interest. So you're all well aware that mitral regurgitation is the most frequent valve disease in Europe and the US. Um, its frequency is, is certainly double that of aortic stenosis. Um, it's estimated that nearly one in 10 people aged 75 or older have moderate or severe MR. And that estimation means that it's about 4.2 million patients in the US alone. The frequency increases with increasing age, as does so for all valvular heart disease. There are a number of studies, um, these are from 2014, 2007, in Europe and US, showing that about 50% of patients with mitral regurgitation are treated medically and are not given any interventional therapy. Since this is a heart failure population, these patients do poorly with medical therapy with a high one-year mortality, a 50% five-year mortality, and a very high rate of heart failure hospitalization. However, these are often patients with multiple comorbidities, low ejection fractions, and it can sometimes be hard to understand the impact of mitral regurgitation on these patients. So Maurice Serrano, who's on, uh, who's on the panel, is the senior author on this recent publication in Lancet, um, which looks at uh, close to 1,300 community residents from Altstead County who have moderate or severe isolated mitral regurgitation. And what they did was compare the survival of these patients with isolated moderate severe MR to the expected survival of the general population in Obstead County of the same age and sex. And you see in the red line is the observed <coughs> mortality, uh, survival for patients uh, with isolated MR. They have about a 2.2 fold higher risk of mortality. If you look at patients with a lower ejection fraction, less than 50%, that mortality increases by threefold. It's also interesting, the analysis in the study looking at the differences between primary and secondary mitral regurgitation. And if we look at mortality, patients with secondary mitral regurgitation have a mortality that, that is 2.7-fold higher. They have an extremely high risk of heart failure at five years, 78%. And only a minority were being treated surgically, so 5% were offered mitral surgery. So really, a, a group of patients with a significant mobility and mortality, and majority are not being treated. So CardioBand offers a potential solution for patients with functional mitral regurgitation through annular reduction. For those of you who have not seen the system, I'll take you through it quickly. This is a transvenous transeptal system inserted through the femoral vein. After transeptal puncture, you have a transeptal sheath that's advanced into the left atrium. 
through the sheath, you then have a steerable catheter with the device attached. So this is the cardio band, and the device is then attached in a stepwise fashion from the anterolateral trigone to the posterior medial trigone using a series of anchors. Once the cardio band is fully implanted, then on a beating heart, the size is adjusted, the, the mitral annulus is cinched, and you have live, live adjustability and reduction of MR, and you can then adjust the result as you watch the echocardiography. So the key advantages of the system is it, it's directed to one of the mechanisms of functional mitral regurgitation, which is annular reduction. It's an adjustable implantation based on each patient's anatomy. And the fact that you have real-time confirmation of the result and can adjust the result real-time is important. I thought I'd share with you one of the commercial patients we treated uh, with this device. So this was a patient outside of studies, a 75-year-old male with ischemic cardiomyopathy, previous bypass with patent memories, patent left and right memory, and so was considered high risk for repeat surgery. He had permanent atrial fibrillation and a pacemaker and was in New York Heart Association 3. He had moderate to severe MR with annular dilatation dysfunction and ejection fraction of 45%. And you can see the echo at the bottom confirming the annular dilatation and the large jet of mitral regurgitation. We offered this patient um, cardioband, and here's some clips from the procedure. Uh, you see we looked at the, right, the circumflex artery in this patient to make sure that we were not going to damage the circumflex artery, but also it can be a useful landmark to guide the procedure because it does tell you where the annulus is, particularly on the first part in the region of P1, P2. And here you see the anchors being inserted. We insert a series of anchors. The number of anchors depends on the size of the device we're implanting, and we generally implant one anchor every eight millimeters. Here you see we're getting towards the end of the procedure. We've covered the entire posterior annulus with the device, and that's the full device implanted. Once we've implanted the full device, there's a contraction wire that we use then to adjust the device. Here are some images. The procedures guided by echocardiography, biplane, and multi-slice echo are extremely useful in identifying where the delivery system is in relation to the hinge point. So here you see the full device implanted with the size adjustment tool attached, and this is what we'll use to then reduce annular dimensions and cause cinching of the mitral annulus. I want you to notice what it looks like before we cinch and after we cinch. And notice how these anchors are much closer together and how we've really reduced annular dimensions with the device. Well, let's see what that looks like on echocardiography. This was the patient's baseline result. Here you see the result post-contraction, really an excellent result, almost no MR. And here on 3D echo, you see the cardioband implanted, which I think for many is indiscernible from a surgical annuloplasty ring. We called the patient back last week to see how he was doing. This is two and a half years after we did the cardio ban. His mitral regurgitation, as you can see on the right, remains mild at two and a half years. His LV ejection fraction is stable. He's had no admissions for heart failure. Um, he's got some RV dilatation, so I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if he's going to need a cardio ban on his tricuspid as well. I would like to share with you also the clinical data to support this procedure and to support this device. Uh, we were involved in the CMARC trial, uh, which enrolled to um, the initial patients in the study. So this was a essentially a first-in-man study, but large enough in order to get data to obtain CMARC. It was a single-arm, multi-center prospective study um, that had enrolled 61 patients. 60 were implanted. We have one-year follow-up on 42 patients and two-year follow-up on 34 patients. There were some deaths. Remember, this is in a heart failure population, so it's not surprising. If we look at the total cohort of 61 patients, the average age was 72. The etiology was <clears throat> ischemic in the majority of patients. 87% of patients were in NYHA class 3 or 4. Majority of patients had atrial fibrillation. So I think a typical heart failure population. If we look at 30-day events, we had two deaths. One was an intracranial hemorrhage and one multi-organ failure following elective mitral surgery. The intracranial hemorrhage was not related to the procedure of the device. There was one myocardial infarction, two bleeding complications, one case of tamponade. 
There were no cases of device migration, embolization, no mitral stenosis. Remember, this was all the initial experience. There were no compassionate use cases done before this. So this was all the, the early learning experience, including um, us trying to figure out how to use the device. There were some early learnings. We did have some device, de uh, de device detachments or some anchor detachments in the early experience and adjusted the device accordingly. One of the major differences was actually increasing the anchor length, which allowed the device to be anchored in a more secure fashion. The two-year data were recently presented for the first time uh, at ESC, and this is the data. If we look at survival at two years, it's 79%. If we look at MR reduction at two years, and this is all evaluated by Core Lab, if we look at all the cohort that has um, echoes available and that were analyzable at two years, we see the majority of patients, 96%, had MR of grade two or less are only a minority of patients with, with grade three or four. So it is interesting to see the consistency of the data and the durability of the result. These are now paired analyses for 26 patients in which we had echoes at every time point. And again, in that paired analysis, you see the majority of patients were in a MR grade two or less at two years. The device functions by annular reduction and caused about 29% annular reduction. And this was again sustained up to the two year follow up point. Being a heart failure population, really what we're interested in is making our patients feel better. And really, we did see signs of that in the study. At two years, 83% of patients were in NYHA class one or two. There was in improvement in heart failure scores and also an improvement in six minute walk distance. So if I can conclude, I think the cardio, cardio band procedure has become a standardized and predictable approach to treating functional mitral regurgitation. If we look at the early experience, the CardioBand shows a favorable safety profile and provides significant and durable reduction in mitral regurgitation through annular reduction. We saw 95% of patients having MR of grade two or less at one year, which was sustained at two years, a high rate of survival at one year, and no evidence of late detachments or mitral stenosis. There were also clinically significant improvements in functional status quality of life and exercise capacity at one year that was sustained to two years. I think one of the major advantages of the device is the fact that it preserves patient's anatomy, and so it allows future options. If these patients need to be treated for recurrent mitral regurgitation, they can undergo valve replacement or edge-to-edge -edge or other leaflet therapies in the future. So I'd like to finish by really um, thanking and, uh, the sites, the participating sites who participate in the CMARC study. And um, these data, and this would not be possible without the patients and the sites who are involved. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Azim, for a masterful talk as ever and for keeping so promptly to time. We have a very large audience and um, a number of people in this room will have no experience with this procedure and they will be looking at the device and thinking that it looks very challenging. Mm -hmm. Can you give some insights on to procedural duration, the common challenges, and um, the skill sets required to take on this, this form of intervention? Sure. Um, I think you know, the skill set's similar to doing other transcatheter mitral valve interventions, so certainly for physicians who have experience doing edge-to-edge uh, -edge therapies will adjust to this device easier because they know about how to, how to do transeptal punctures, how to interpret imaging, and how to navigate in the left atrium. I think what distinguishes this device from other devices is the fact that it's a very stepwise approach, so every procedure is the same. You're always starting at the anterolateral trigone, you're treating the entire posterior annulus and finishing at the posterior medial trigone. So I think as far as the procedural steps, it's very reproducible. The training has become also quite uh, reproducible and easy to learn. So if, to train for this procedure, they are now uh, simulators that, you know, the company comes into your cath lab with a simulator that they put under your fluoroscopy, and you can practice two or three, as many times as you want, with your echocardiographer, getting online imaging, doing the fluoro, and actually doing the procedure. What for me has made the procedure, I guess, reproducible is the fact that we've now learned exactly how to navigate the device around the annulus. As far as skill sets, I think the imaging is, quite, is more intensive probably than mitral clip procedures because you really need to see every single anchor going into the tissue and be sure that you're not touching leaflets. 
Um, with all devices, there's a learning curve. I remember the first procedures being over three hours, but recently we can do procedures even in an hour and a half and two hours in experienced hands. I think there will be other advancements and iterations on this device in the future. So you can imagine if you, de if you had to implant half the number of anchors, how much easier it would be, uh, how much shorter the procedure would be. And there are also some imaging innovation that will make it easier to see where the tip of the catheter is in the future. So uh, uh, there is already some reaction from the audience. And the first reaction is, uh, I will filter a little bit, uh, what is the role of direct and indirect annuoplasty in your, pra in your practice? Um, maybe we should ask that question to Stefan, because in our practice we've only done really direct annuoplasty. We did a couple of cases of indirect annuoplasty a number of years ago, um, but once we moved to direct annuoplasty and saw the outcomes intra-procedure, at the end of the procedure, seeing the reduction of MR at the end of the procedure convinced us, and so we've remained a center that offers direct annual plasty along with edge to edge therapies. Here's another challenging question for you, uh, Azim, which relates to the breaking data from Mitra France and the, the impact that's had on the discussion. We're still awaiting outcomes of COAPT, of course, in two weeks' time, but do you think there's any inclination that CardioBend and, and annular reduction could now take us in a new direction and it could become a first-line approach? Sure. I think the fact that now we can offer patients a therapy based on the mechanism of their MR is important. Some may argue that you know, if we had better reductions on mitral regurgitation, mitral FR, there may have been different outcomes. I think we have to wait and see. It's still early. There is a pivotal study in the U.S that will be randomizing patients to cardio band versus medical therapy. And I think that will give us a better idea uh, of what outcomes will be in a heart failure population. And last but not least, there is another question more clinical. Yes. Which is, uh, uh, do you see deterioration of left ventricular function after uh, cardio band? And if so, is, is there any predictor of this event? Yeah. So, I think you know, we, we've seen after both mitral clip and cardioban, we've had a couple of cases of afterload mismatch. So we've reduced the mitral regurgitation so to such a degree that there's been a reduction in forward flow and cardiac output with hypotension. And um, these have not been predictable, uh, other than the fact that these were patients, all of them with very low ejection fractions and dilated left ventricles. Um, the advantage you have in the cath lab, if it happens immediately, is you can let go of some of the cinching, wait for the patient to recover, and then cinch again. All the cases that we've had, and they've been really minimal, a handful with cardioband, maybe two that I can remember, and the patients did very well just with supportive therapy. So giving them some inotropes for 12 to 24 hours, they were able to get through the afterload mismatch and recover LV function. So thank you very much, Azim. It's time to move forward. So uh, you provided a very nice overview of the epidemiology and the clinical implications of mitral regurgitation. And it's a great pleasure now to introduce uh, Morris Serrano from the Mayo Clinic to do the same task for tricuspid. Morris's uh, mission in 2018 has to be to make the tricuspid valve the memorable valve. <laughs> I will try to remember that. Thanks, Bernard and Francesco. Uh, we're going to switch to another valve, which is the tricuspid valve, and, and look at the challenges in our, in our practice. And here is a, a challenging patient. So it's a patient that I saw, a 75-year-old woman with very low level activity, you know, uh, barely driving to Walmart to, as, as the main activity, <laughs> physical activity of pushing on, on the pedals of the car. She complains of no shortness of breath, but of the epigastric pain with activity. She has no murmur and uh, has a heart failure with enlarged liver, hepatojugular reflux, and, and, and she has, as you can see, a, a very large cardiomegaly. And here is the uh, echo. This is the left side. This is the right side. And this is what we found in this patient, which is a massive degree of tricuspid regurgitation that was not suspected on clinical grounds. So when we look at tricuspid regurgitation, it, it is, uh, there are recent data that we looked in our community. This is the orange curve is the total left-sided valve disease. And you see that there is for tricuspid regurgitation the same link with age, that it increases with age. And overall, the prevalence 
at any given time is around 0.6%, which means that in the US we have uh, uh, around 1.6 million people with a moderate or severe tricuspid regurgitation. If you compare that to um, uh, the number of operation, eight to 10,000, you see that most people with tricuspid regurgitation never are treated. And in our own community, only 2.4% of people with moderate or severe tricuspid regurgitation ever get a surgical treatment for tricuspid regurgitation. So, so TR is frequent, but is clinically ignored. And managing TR starts with imaging. Now, if we talk about imaging and the criteria to look at, uh, at TR, you see jets here that are very different, but this guy had severe TR and the jet was eccentric and it's not easy to look at jets. So we recommend to look at the vena contracta and to quantify tricuspid regurgitation. These are the guidelines and the guidelines give you indication of what is severe, what is uh, mild TR. Uh, I invite you to consider to increase the quantitation. We, uh, in our place, do uh, some quantitation, but we need to gain and to do more quantitation in routine practice because the number are recorded with the grading and it's very useful in, in quantifying those patients. Um, you can see that here in this editorial paper that there are a suggestion of using different terms not just severe, but massive, torrential, uh, super duper, uh, enormous, ginormous. You can invent whatever term you want, but what I invite you to consider is the, is the numbers and to, to have the numbers in your head to quantify the tricuspid regurgitation. And quantification is possible. It's feasible on the tricuspid. A little bit more complicated because you need to consider the angle of the leaflets, and then you calculate the RO and the regurgitant volume. Do not, be, do not even look at the regurgitant volume because it is mostly low, because it's a low pressure system. And you see here, you can quantify the tricuspid regurgitation, even in this uh, very severe tricuspid regurgitation. And here you have a sense for the enormity of the TR, which is 2.7 centimeters square of effective regurgitant orifice that we almost never see on the left side. People are dead well before that point when they have mitral regurgitation. So it's a different scale that we have to remember, and we need to quantify TR to have appropriate imaging on these patients. Now, what about the outcome, the TR clinical outcome? Everybody knows about this paper uh, that was published by Nathan Jack years ago, and it shows a very nice separation between uh, the absence of TR and severe TR, and, and it looks like it's, uh, it's real. Uh, but the problem is that these people have a number of associated condition and TR is very heterogeneous. And the problem with TR is to separate them into their clinical context specifically. And so when you look at the burden of tricuspid regurgitation, you see that there is a wide variety of context the largest here is the left valvular context, but there is also pulmonary hypertension, LV dysfunction, isolated TR, organic TR, congenital TR. All of these have to be seen in their specific context for these patients. And, and when you look at the age of those patients, most of these people are in their mid-70s. So we're going to be treating people who are not young, and, and, the, and it's very important to have minimally invasive means of treating these patients. So here is the heterogeneity, an example of rheumatic tricuspid regurgitation, severe TR with systolic reversal in the hepatic veins, uh, an, an example of, of uh, an uh, organic valve disease with carcinoid valve disease here with stenosis and regurgitation, so another type of organic valve disease. An example that we often quote with organic disease, this is a pacemaker-induced tricuspid regurgitation, and you can see that it can be very severe in those patients with marked right ventricular enlargement. And uh, here is a case of isolated tricuspid regurgitation. 
And, and it looks like an enormous dilatation of the atria and the right ventricle, but you see after treatment, and here it's a tricuspid valve replacement, you see how much of the right ventricle has shrunk. These patients benefit when they are treated and well treated. And here is a case with pulmonary hypertension. You recognize the ventricle, sort of more spherical, less contractile, the elevated tricuspid regurgitation velocity, and the large jet of regurgitation. What do we do for these patients with this type of ventricle? And so when we look at these uh, uh, heterogeneity of the tricuspid regurgitation, you see it. It's not just the TR with the severe TR is a low EF, RV dilatation, and things that are different from the mild TR. So it's very difficult to say, is it the TR or is it something else in the clinical context that is causing the patient to have a poor outcome and what data do we have on outcome of these patients? So is it really independent of the EF or the pulmonary hypertension? And here is the data in our community, and you can see that uh, the, the mortality in pink, the heart failure and the atrial fibrillation, the rates per year are really enormous in our community. Very high rates of complication, in part due to the comorbidity, but also in, in great part due to the tricuspid regurgitation. And even the isolated TR, has excess mortality in green towards the red of control patients. And so we're going to pay more attention to the isolated TR, very often associated with atrial fibrillation. And you can see that in those patients, here is the example that we had seen before. We can see that in those patients, the people who have a large degree of TR have indeed a high rate of mortality, much more than the people who have a uh, uh, a mild, mild TR in those patients, high rate of cardiac events in those patients. So even if you have a normal left ventricle, no pulmonary hypertension, and just the TR, still it is causing an excess mortality and an excess rate of cardiac events. And more recently, we've had added data on tricuspid regurgitation associated with LV dysfunction. And even in this context of patients where we compared the TR to controls with trivial TR, so we could adjust for the pulmonary pressure in those patients. And even in those patients, the TR is a marker for an excess risk here of mortality and here of cardiac events. We will need larger series of patients with tricuspid regurgitation associated with heart failure. But if you imagine the number of patients with heart failure, there is a considerable need for treatment of these patients after the appropriate clinical trials are done in those patients because TR is very significant. So what have we learned about tricuspid regurgitation? TR is underdetected and undertreated, and we need to do something about these patients to pay attention to them. We need to do tricuspid regurgitation quantitation in the echo lab. Severe TR is highly significant independently of the EF and the pulmonary hypertension, but we need also to pay attention to the moderate TR and to define in those patients who warrants treatment because these people do not have a great outcome. Thank you so much for your attention. So, Maurice, I think uh, really your data uh, always are a great ground for uh, developing new therapies. Although, as you mentioned, uh, it's always the same problem. Is it a, just an indicator of prognosis or is a factor for prognosis. So you just mentioned that you identified a ERO more than 0 0.4, a predicting factor for uh, uh, prognosis, in, in, regardless of uh, RV function. Now the question is, uh, how do you measure RV function in these patients? What is the best way to understand that? And how do we answer to the question or how to inform our heart failure specialists who are a little bit reluctant to send us patients? Yeah. 
No, I agree with you. You always ask a difficult question, huh? Is, um, the, the issue of the RV function is, is very difficult. In fact, we, we looked recently at that. Is it indispensable to measure TAPSI and everything and, and only refer those patients with TR when we have all the measures in the world? Our simple assessment of, tricuspid, uh, of, um, of RV function in those patients was as predictive of the outcome as all the measures. So, uh, yes, in our lab, for most patients, we do the qualitative assessment. Very bad, bad, uh, somewhat, and then okay. But uh, there is more work needed for that. I suppose that the patients who have the worst RV, we're not going to touch them. But there are a lot of people who have some alteration of the RV and the benefit from reducing the load related to tricuspid regurgitation. We'll know when we do the clinical trials, but I think we, we shouldn't be afraid of the RV unless it's really advanced. Now, if we are contemplating such studies, uh, Maurice, which we clearly are, and some have already been completed, what do you think are the clinically significant endpoints? It's more than just reducing ERO, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah the, um, you know, the, some, some of the initial results, you, you make it very, very severe to just severe. And so um, the end point has to be clinical, is less liver, less dyspnea, less fatigue, ability to walk longer. And, and, uh, and in fact, that's what we see with a patient treated surgically, but I'm sure that we'll see that also with the devices. So I think uh, you just mentioned one thing which is critical for me. We have daily discussions saying that tricuspid regurgitation, it cannot be the cause of this preance. So I ask ah. you from your perspective, what is your reading of this? So what no. is the connection between this preance and TR? Uh, there are the, the, the connection is the lack of cardiac output, is the... Uh, um, the um, the, the tricuspid regurgitation prevents the cardiac output to follow the exercise, and people who cannot increase their cardiac output uh, present with dyspnea. This has been studied in a small number of patients in the, in the lab at Mayo, not by me, but by some, one of my colleagues, and it is the lack of increase of cardiac output, because the question comes, how come TR causes dyspnea? So most, of, most often patients complain of fatigue, which is a very non-specific, but a, a number of times they complain of dyspnea because they cannot get their cardiac output. In addition, there is another phenomenon is that they have hepatalgia. And hepatalgia is not a pain, it is a sensation of bloating in the, in the epigastric area. And when the patients are moving, they fill their stomach fuller and they cannot advance anymore. So they feel that that as limiting their physical activity. And so that's atypical symptoms, and you have to pay attention to those patients. Maurice, tremendous. We also have some questions, but we have to move forward. We keep this question for later. We move forward with the uh, next speaker, which is uh, uh, Stefan von Bardleben, who will uh, <clears throat> describe a solution for uh, tricuspid insufficiency. Thank you, Francesco. And we now draw attention, could you get up the slides, uh, to the address solution for treating patients suffering from tricuspic valve disease. Um, this is my disclosures. Um, as we already heard by Maurice, uh, we have a large um, patient population that suffers from moderate to severe tricuspic regurgitation. While the number of patients that are actively, even with symptoms, being surgically operated is less than 8,000. Uh, we already saw this data from San Francisco, Neff, uh, and Foster, uh, and we can appreciate that the severity as well as the right ventricular dysfunction corresponds to a poor prognosis. The main mechanism of the uh, insufficiency at 80% of tricuspic regurgitation is functional, so secondary to a tricuspic ring dilatation, which happens mainly on the free mural wall, which is attached to the anterior and posterior uh, leaflet. 
So the Edwards Cardiometric Cosmic Valve Reconstruction System is the first CE-approved transcatheter device for the treatment of tricuspic regurgitation. It is a transcatheter transvenous system to treat the TR through the annular reduction, similar to the approach by surgery, and it happens to have a shortened learning curve, as Azim pointed it out, for the users of cardioband mitral as well as edge-to-edge -edge therapies. To give you an overview of these techniques, you start also by a simple venous puncture. The sheave has the same size than for the mitral treatment system, and you can see that we don't need any transeptal puncture, of course, because we have open and direct access to the tricuspic valve from the right atrium. You then start near the aortic root and near the right coronary ostium, unlike the circumflex, um, to start circular from the interior leaflet to the posterior leaflet in the beginning of the posterior septum to anchor up to 17 anchors uh, inside the lower myocardium of the right ventricle. Then after this, you have under beating heart conditions the possibility to cinch and to relax um, the annular dilatation uh, of the individual patient. This is a typical pre and post from the colleagues from Bonn, as you can see here. We take as a marker the circumference of the right coronary artery around the tricuspic annulus, and you see that in segment one and two we have the anterior leaflet, whereas in segment three we happen to have the posterior leaflet. This is the first case to illustrate the technique. It's an 80-year-old male from our institution who had an isolated, as pointed out by Maurice, very severe torrential uh, TR, uh, grade four, and as you can see, the vena contracta area was 2.7 centimeters square, so absolutely matching your presentation, Maurice, and also corresponding septolateral diameter of 5.4 centimeters, and this caused torrential regurgitation. The patient thus presented with an isolated, dilated right ventricle and atrium, um, and invasive systolic PA pressure measurements of about 60 to 65 millimeters mercury with a slightly elevated VEG pressure. You can nicely see the procedure. So first hand as a marker, we put in a wire, which is either a radiopac hydrophilic marker or a normal BMW, depending on your fluoroscopy system. And you see that we will go all the way along in the right uh, anterior oblique uh, orientation and in LAO orientation um, along the um, tricuspic annulus. This is this individual gentleman before and after chinching, and you see that the implant original size is given on the left-hand side, and you can appreciate that the right coronary artery, including all side branches and the right ventricular branch, is unaffected. This is the situation pre-cardioband given on the top and the situation intra-procedural in the cath lab on the table post-cardioband. We happen to have an 18-month follow-up of this specific gentleman, and the normal way to follow up these patients under normal hemodynamic conditions is to use a simple TTE examination. You can see the situation before in the top two images, and you see the cardioband follow-up at 12 months as well as 18 months. So it's my pleasure also to tell you about the uh, cardioband tricuspic repair system randomized control trial, which is a single arm multicenter prospective study to evaluate the performance and safety of the cardioband tricuspic system. And I will disclose here the six month result with a high follow up. The inclusion criteria were chronic functional tricuspic regurgitation, grade two plus to four plus on a scale of four plus with an elevated systolic pulmonary pressure being less or equal 60 millimeters of mercury. And an ongoing, this is important, symptomatic guideline-directed medical therapy with a minimum also directed diuretic regimen and a left ventricular ejection fraction of at least 30%. These were the participating sites in this uh, tree repair study. Uh, the baseline concluded uh, 30 patients, where we have complete follow-up at 30 days and um, one missed visit uh, at six months. So the follow-up rate here is extremely high, above 90% uh, in this study. 
and I present you the paired analysis. To look at the age group, this corresponds very nicely to the presentation of Marie Serrano as the mean age of the patients is 75 years. It's a predominant female population of 73%, with a baseline New York Heart Association class 3 or 4 in 83% of all cases. It is to be noted that in all studies on tricuspic regurgitation, the rate of atrial fibrillation is much higher than in the mitral regurgitation part, and it reaches, as you can see here, 93%. 17% of the patients had prior stroke or transient ischemia, and there was a high rate of 53% of moderate or severe renal failure, and 13% having electrodes in the right ventricle. The device success, deployment and positioning of the cardio band was possible at all sites in all cases, so 100%. The safety profile at 30 days showed a, a mortality of 6.7%, one being device, possibly device-related, one being unrelated, a stroke rate of 1, 3.3%, some bleeding complications, but you can note that 77% had none of the mentioned complications and above events. If we look into the annular reduction in a paired analysis with over 90% follow-up rate, we can nicely see that a discharge 30 days as well as six months, there was a sustained annular reduction uh, that was kept stable over time. The same holds true on the significant reduction in TR severity both at 30 days compared to baseline, as well as at six months. And you can nicely see that the event rate of torrential regurgitation, as well as PISA arrow A's below 0.5 or 0.4, which is significant for clinical outcome, have been markedly reduced. If we look also at the sustained echo improvement, we can see that the PISA array was reduced by one degree that confounds with severity, which is 0 0.37 uh, centimeters square down to rate of 0 0.39, which is a reduction to half uh, of the regurgitant volume. The vena contractor was also affected by 27% as well as the stroke volume increased by about 6% improvement. If we look into the clinical effectiveness parameters, the functional improvement at six months was marked. And there was a six-minute walk test improvement of over 60 meter, which is relatively high from 266 to 326 meters. The Kansas score for quality of life increased by 24 points. And the initial rate of New York Heart Association class patients being at 83% in class 3 or 4 was reduced and converted into a rate of being in New York Heart Association class 1 or 2 at a rate of 88%. The presence of edema was uh, reducted and there was no edema present in more than 72% of all cases in a paired analysis. So I come to the study conclusions. Patients with functional tricuspic regurgitation have a large unmet need with limited safe treatment options. In our early feasibility experience, the CardiBand tricuspic system provides a significant reduction in effective regurgitant orifice area through annular reduction and is sustained at six months with a high follow-up rate of more than 90%. Clinically and statistically significant improvements in functional status, quality of life, and exercise capacity could be noted at six months. It has to be noted that it's the first CE Mark transcatheter tricuspic repair system, and study experience has provided valuable learnings for further studies. So further studies are warranted to validate these initial promising results. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So there's some very important questions here which relate to the, the design of the study that you've been describing and uh, particularly uh, the selection of patients. And the, there's one specific question on the screen uh, which relates to the presence or absence of pulmonary hypertension, particularly in the case that you demonstrated. So if you could address that one and then I've got two other factors to ask you about.
Absolutely. So there is limited knowledge, actually, of what is the exact threshold that we should not treat anymore. So, of course, there are an isolated tricuspic regurgitation. We typically have systolic PA pressures that are well below 60 millimeters of mercury. There's a lot of mixed disease with some parts of also primary hypertension that had elevated uh, um, PA pressures as well as post-capillary uh, situations after treatment of the left-sided disease. Um, the, uh, there was a consensus in the main studies to use 60 millimeters mercury um, as a cutoff value for the studies. And the first um, demonstration that I showed you was a run-in compassionate use patient that had five millimeters of mercury more, but it was very similar. And you could see that he was a very, very severely diseased patient, but he was outside the study. And then my second two factors were, number one, any particular patterns of right coronary anatomy that would make you cautious. And secondly, there was a statement in the exclusion criteria regarding the presence of a pacemaker lead with, I think it was tethering. And I wonder if you could just clarify that. This is why I stressed to start with your second question first. This is why I wanted to stress that we had 13% of patients in with pacemakers that were not impinging or tethering uh, one of the three tricuspic leaflets. So they were free or they were in the posterior commissure, which unaffects the effect of the cardioband, and you could even go around it. It's not preferred, but it was allowed inside the study if it was not affecting or causing uh, the tricuspic regurgitation. And the right coronary anatomy? The right coronary anatomy can be variable. The right coronary um, artery primarily serves as a marker for the inner lying annulus. And we, we tend to use a wire because it makes the procedure faster and easier. Um, there are some, some situations that you do not like to have severe coronary artery disease in those patients as a coronary wire is placed throughout the procedure, which can take, as uh, Asim pointed out, one and a half or two hours. You have to make sure that you have adequate anticoagulation also throughout this procedure, and the right coronary artery is um, liable to spasm. So this could be something. The size actually is not such a problem uh, in this specific procedure. And George, if we can just turn to you, you also had a lot of clinical experience with this device. Have you had any complications with the right coronary beyond spasm? Have there been more important complications? Um, uh, not at our site, but we had complications or we had issues with the right coronary artery during the trial in the, as early experience. Uh, the major, the major question with the right coronary artery is the proximity to, to, the, to the hinge point where you want to place in between you have to place your anchors and if the right coronary artery is very close you are of course at risk that you would screw an anchor into the right coronary artery and this actually happened in, in the very early experience in, in, in two cases. Um, in one case it was nicely resolved by placing a stent and in another case it was just a, a very small branch a side branch of the right coronary artery, but which at the end of the day caused then some problems. But uh, this is something which we can prevent. Uh, that's about the learning curve. Okay, Stefan, thank you so much. So we're now going to actually turn to George Nikonig, who has very extensive experience with a variety of mitral and tricuspid uh, procedures. And George, I think, has a, a recorded case of a tricuspid cardioband um, this is a patient uh, I would like to share with you. It's a 70 years old pa female patient. Most of these patients are female, by the way, at least in the trial and also I think in the clinical, in the clinical experience. She uh, experienced dyspnea, New York heart glass free, which is a typical symptom as we have learned just recently. Also, the pathophysiology is clear. Chronic renal failure is also uh, frequently a confounder of tricuspid regurgitation. She has some cardiac history, uh, no significant coronary artery disease, which would be not a contraindication uh, against placing a, a, a cardioband, even if you have uh, coronary issues in the right coronary artery, that you don't get this comment wrong. A preserved left ventricular injection fraction and this severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation, as you can appreciate here on that slide. PISA is uh, almost one, vena contractor 1.4, uh, arrow 1.2 square centimeters, and this is uh, at the transgastric view of the, pa of the patient. This is anterior, septal, posterior.
bacteria, and you can appreciate there is uh, no uh, co-optation whatsoever. There is a severe central uh, tricuspid regurgitation, and there is also some tenting if you look here at the, at the second view and they explain. So what is the setup in the in the in the in the hybrid room, uh, we try to work with a biplan uh, situation, always with cardioband, makes it, makes it much easier and accelerates the procedure. You have a, a, a six French uh, uh, sheath in the right, in the arteria, uh, femoral artery for the right coronary artery. There you can see it. We prefer to use a fielder XT wire because it's really nicely opaque and you can follow, follow this throughout the procedure. And uh, I'll stop here for a second. What you also have to do upfront before the procedure as a pre-procedural planning is you not only have to go for the clinical assessment, also for echo, but also for CT scan. This is absolutely uh, important because you want to know about the uh, proximity of the right coronary artery. You want to understand about the size of the of the. Uh, of the uh, of the annulus of the tricuspid annulus and so on about the the angles you have to use for for your catheter and also about the projections you're going to use during the procedure because if you are working with a biplan machine you can adjust one 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 angle to a a, a planar view and the other one to an on fast view which eases up the procedure quite a bit and then you have predictions I hope I hope you can see this I hope you can see this yellow and this blue dots on this iPad you have a prediction of the anatomy you will find which means the right coronary artery and also the aortic root and then you have also a prediction where to where to place the anchors and this is quite helpful um, and you go with a plan into this procedure and you have this uh, always on, uh, on the table for each projection you are using uh, during the cardioband procedure. And uh, in the former days, we also saw the, uh, the, the shape of the, of the catheter, and you could, you could compare that with the shape of your actual catheter, which is also sometimes helpful, especially if you're doing the first procedures. Uh, you know exactly when you screwed it up completely and when, when you have to start all over again. This is a stand for the cardioband, comparable to the mitroclip situation. So you need, of course, a venous axis, as mentioned. You have a stiff wire sitting in the in the carbal vein and then you access the the sheath for the cardioband which is also 24 french and after after placing the sheath uh, which will come up here in the right atrium you're going to get rid of the of the dilator of course you have to de-air the system and then you bring in uh, this uh, this catheter here, uh, which is a catheter harboring the cardioband system, uh, you can uh, turn around, uh, negotiate the catheter in all kinds of dimensions uh, through through the uh, through the atrium, through the right atrium. And also, you could use it in, in on the left side. And then you have to find out your positioning, where you are located with your cardioband tip at the annulus and what's very helpful here is to work with 3D volumes. This is a flexi slice uh, application as you can easily appreciate and here you can for example see uh, the adjustments of, of the echocardiographer to the, to the scenario he's facing right now. This is an echo driven procedure by the way and uh, once the system is up and running uh, you can follow this flexi slice even without uh, uh, modifying the positioning of the probe too much throughout at least some of the anchors to be implanted and once you are very sure about the positioning of your of your cardio band with uh, at the annulus uh, it is critical that you don't screw this anchor into the leaflet so you want to be a bit away from the uh, from the leaflet of course and then you start to implant these anchors uh, this anchor is attached to a catheter. It's just pushed in into, into, the, into the GTS, and then it, it's brought up to the tip of the cardioband, and then it is under visualization with echo and also fluoroscopy. It, it's driven into, into the annulus. And I, 
I will show that to you in a second. So uh, as mentioned already by the previous speaker, it's also very helpful to, to use fluoroscopy because you have a wire sitting in the right coronary artery. As you can see here, uh, this is a plan of view and you can also give a bit of contrast dye and then you start to screw in this first anchor. You have to be very sure. Here you can nicely witness this uh, throughout uh, fluoroscopy and then you can do a, 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 a tuck test, which means you're pulling on the system and usually you can see that uh, uh, in real time also on echocardiography and also of course on fluoroscopy. This is very important because it, it proves that the system is or the anchor is nicely attached uh, uh, to the annulus. So once you are done uh, with the first anchor, you know exactly where to place the first anchor from pre-planning by CT. Usually it's about two and a half centimeters from the middle of the aorta, roughly. And you can also do this on fast view and give some contrast dye. This is the first anchor here, and you can, uh, you can easily appreciate, I'll stop here for a second, that we are still far away from the right coronary artery. Sometimes you have to get a bit closer, then you can change also the projection of the anchor in order not to, uh, to, to implant the anchor into the right coronary artery. Here, this is a comfortable situation, uh, lots of space between the right coronary artery and, and the system. And here you can also nicely evaluate this is if you would uh, uh, dive with this anchor deeply down into this direction, it would have been somewhere in the right ventricle. So it's also important that you know fluoroscopy, that you know how to interpret what you see on, also on fluoroscopy. Uh, this is uh, the next uh, uh, one. Next step, it has to be released. The anchor has to be released from the catheter, and then we develop a bit more of this of this cardio band, and and it, it will stick out of the catheter, uh, which enables us then to place the next anchor. Uh, and the first three anchor have to sit very close to each other because we have learned from the engineers that the that the tension and the force applied is highest in this in this in this area and as you can here see the second anchor is 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 deployed very closely to the first anchor and this will happen also to to the third anchor it's a very calm procedure you can always um, unscrew this anchor, get, get rid of it again if you are not 100% sure. Um, you should do uh, fluoroscopy and maybe give a bit of contrast dye if you're unsure about the proximity of the right coronary artery. But most of the time it's echo driven. Here you can nicely see on 2D now, just for a change. This is not a flexi slice. This is a spool and this is a catheter. Um, you can nicely visualize the positioning of the cardioband tip um, on the annulus. So again, there are two, two critical structures, leaflet in, in the middle of the valve and then the right coronary artery, of course, uh, outside, outside the annulus. Here we are back in, 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 in flexi slice and, and usually you can continue with this uh, um, uh, on the anterior side and also on the on the lateral side, sometimes on the on the posterior side, it's a bit difficult. This is the third, the third anchor screwed in. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you every anchor um, being deployed during the procedure. Uh, but these are very very important and very critical. And once you have set up the whole system, it's going to be much easier because imaging is used to the patient. Uh, you are used to the imaging, and then usually you can go on uh, quite fast uh, with the procedure. Not in every case, of course. It all depends only on imaging. The procedure itself to steer the, the catheter is very trivial. What is very important that you have nice imaging and that you understand your imaging uh, being provided by the echocardiographer. So uh, by the, uh, then you implant usually 16 to 17 anchors in, uh, in a tricuspid uh, valve because the tricuspid valve is pretty large. Uh, in, in the mitral, sometimes you get away with, uh, with 13, 14, 15 anchors. Here we are uh, on the way uh, to, the posterior, uh, to the posterior annulus. The coronary sinus is somewhere here. And, and the AV knot is somewhere around here. You, you probably don't want to screw it into the AV knot. Uh, it may not harm, nobody really knows, nobody has proven this so far. And uh, then at the end of the day, you have placed all of these anchors 
and then you release uh, the last anchor. You you screw in the last anchor, and then you release it. Um, um, you always change between this planner and this on fast view. This is the planner view again, and then you get rid of the system, and the wire is still sitting, of course, uh, within the cardio band. I'm not talking about the wire in the right coronary artery because you need to have this wire uh, in order to foreshorten the system. Now there is a SAT catheter placed over the wire and that attaches to the spool. I will show you in a second. There is a spool and you can turn around the spool with the catheter and by this you can foreshorten the distance between the anchors and you can foreshorten the whole cardio band by four to up to 5.5 um, centimeters. And by this you, you, you nicely shrink, uh, shrink the annulus quite a bit. This is cinching to 2.5. You always have to wait a couple of minutes between, between the cinching processes. And uh, as also pointed out, you can always stop or you can, uh, you can return, you can, uh, you can release the cinching o over time. There is uh, always a, a return point for the procedure. Uh, you have seen this severe TR, uh, usually with cinching 2 or 3.5, nothing happens too much. You have to wait until the late, later stages of, the, of, of, of cinching. Here there is some reduction already if you would measure uh, vena contracta and, and, and all the other quantitative measurements. Uh, but still, it is not to be expected to be too, too, uh, such a major effect after cinching for 3.5 centimeters or so. And I will share with you in a second the, the, the final results. This is 4.4. Maybe we can go on a bit. And this is 5.5. And uh, here you can you can nicely appreciate how close the anchors are now together in comparison to the pre-cinching state uh, with the cardio band. And you nicely reduce the annular dimension as you can just visually appreciate here on that slide. We also always measure this, of course, and usually there is a reduction by, uh, by 20 something, something percent per, per patient. Um, you have seen the data before. And that was the is the final result. This is before the procedure, and this is after procedure. And keep in mind, that was a, a devastating patient with a huge hole within the tricuspid the central hole. And I think this is a, is a nice result. We reduced it, uh, we think, to moderate uh, TR. Um, that procedure has not be, has been done just a couple of weeks ago, so it's hard for us to tell you anything about the clinical performance in that patient. But at least procedure-wise, uh, it was completely uneventful. We reduced the TR. Of course, we did not nail it down to zero. That would not have been expected. But we have a nice uh, effect on the anatomy: 4.3 down to 3.2. If you look at the septolateral diameter. Um, and I think with this, I will stop here, and I thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much. So thank you, Georg, and I think you were stimulating the audience while you were presenting the case. There are a number of uh, questions for you, not only related to the procedural steps. Uh, uh, let's start with the procedural step first, I mean, before we go into the, the clinical part. You know, you, sh you have been telling us several times it's an image-guided procedure, and uh, what is your perception of the challenge between mitral and tricuspid? So is it more difficult, more simple? You know, in mitral clip we learned at the beginning at least it was much more, more difficult, the tricuspid, uh, targeting leaflets. Here we target the annuals. Is the challenge the same or it's better? I mean, technically, it's a bit better because you don't need to go transeptal and, and that it's more straightforward. And another very important issue is that you have a, a wire sitting in the right coronary artery. So this is supportive if echo is not so good. But I think the echo quality, um, in my experience, I had, I had the impression for a while that it is easier in the tricuspid. But I would say I think it's, it's more or less the same. You can run into these uh, difficulties in the mitral, but also in the tricuspid space. But admittedly, there had been a, a, a big-time improvement during the last five years. If you look 
look at the imaging we worked with five years ago, it's no comparison to, to nowadays. So these problems will be resolved. And the question uh, almost related to this, so if you have pacemaker leads on your way, is it a big problem? Is it impacting imaging? It can a bit impact imaging because it can, of course, uh, cause shadowing if, 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 the, if the lead is sitting in the posterior annulus. Usually it's not a problem for the procedure because, as I pointed out, in most of the cases it's sitting, it's sitting in the posterior commissure. Uh, you just have to take care that you start posterior of the, of the lead, uh, otherwise you will tether the, the, the lead to the annulus. Some uh, technical questions uh, from some engineer in the room asking you whether there is erosion with anchors. I don't know if you uh, are ever thinking about erosion with the metal anchors and, the, and always also related to anchors. Uh, what is your experience about uh, detachment? I mean, mitral detachment is almost uh, done, this, is, is covered. Is, okay. Do you see detachment on a tricuspid? I think there is no erosion, it's stainless steel. Uh, I mean, it's too early and, and uh, I don't know how to find this out. <laughs> it would be not so easy uh, once the anchor is in the patient. So I don't think that this is an issue. We had some detachment also on the tricuspid uh, side, uh, probably related to, to imaging issues that we were not absolutely sure where we had placed the anchors. And therefore, within the trial, we also saw some detachment of, of, of the anchors. But this is mainly due to, to issues of the operator and the echocardiographer. I think it's not a problem that the, the tissue, for example, is softer or less resistant in the tricuspid space. This is no, not an issue at all. Okay, Georg, thank you so much. Uh, we move forward uh, in sake of time, and we have uh, uh, Dr. Schuller who is uh, giving us uh, a final overview on the, at the end of the day, the most important topic, how to select the patients. Yeah, thank you very much. I know you've heard a lot of uh, this, this system and, and this device, and when you return to your clinic um, and institutions, you might know how to look for the right patient for a cardioburn procedure. These are my disclosures. So, of course, there are three main data sources. On the one hand, the patient has to have the clinical presentation that you might think of um, putting him under a transcatheter uh, approach for tricuspid or mitral regurgitation, that is for sure, and that should be a matter of a hard team decision in all cases. And the other important screening data sources are, of course, echocardiography and contrast-enhanced multi-slice cardiac CT. So talking about the mitral side, of course, we want to treat functional patients or patients with a little bit of mixed etiology, but with leading um, functional etiology and there are two types type 2 um, and in those patients MR is due to LV dysfunction and type 1 and in those LA dysfunction is the problem and ideally we would treat uh, would like to treat patients with annular dilatation and not too much patients with uh, papillary muscle displacement or severe leaflet tethering you have to identify the mechanism of mitral regurgitation, of course, and there are a number of qualitative and quantitative parameters. You can uh, look for etiology, LV remodeling, or ALA remodeling. You have to uh, keep the annulus in mind. How large is it? Um, is, is the geometry distorted, or what are annular problems? Leaflet morphology is a point, of course, tethering patterns, and so on. And um, in the end, it just leads to this integrated approach that is needed for assessment of mitral regurgitation. And you have to keep in mind, as I said, that there are a number of qualitative and quantitative or semi-quantitative parameters, and you should look for at least some of them to, because only one parameter might not give you um, a good view on the problem. Um, some words um, about leaflet tethering and tenting. We know from surgical patients 
uh, undergoing annuloplasty that leaflet tethering is a predictor of recurrent MR and thus um, uh, bad outcomes. So if tether uh, tethering is severe in your plant cardioband patient and contributes really to the main pathophysiology, the result might not be that good. Um, therefore, those patients might not be optimal, although there is until today no uh, clear evidence that those patients might definitely not profit. Annular calcification is another important point. Of course, severe annular calcification is a contraindication for cardioband procedure because um, it hinders optimal anchoring and thus contracting of the device and it might deteriorate echocardiographic image quality. And of course, cardiac CT is the best method to assess mitral annular calcification. You can get an idea with echo, but uh, more precise, of course, is um, CT. And I just have two examples here. This patient was accepted, although there are some spots of calcium on the mitral annulus, but um, as you can clearly acknowledge here, a patient with this large amount of calcium is no good candidate to get some screw anchors in the mitral annulus in this region. The next thing is annular size and proximity of vessels um, on the left side LCX. And the CT is, of course, the, the current standard method. You can assess the perimeter of the posterior annulus. And there are six sizes of cardioband available at the moment. Um, and uh, the cardioband can cover um, annually from 73 to 120 millimeters. And of course, you have to have enough space to go with your six millimeter anchor safe in the myocardium, not harming the vessel or penetrating into the left ventricular cavity here. 3D TEE might be, in the future, a possible alternative to CT. 2D is surely not accurate enough, but I think for the time being, we have to stick to our CT analysis here. Imaging quality, you have heard that the cardioband procedures are echo-driven, is of course um, mo of most importance, and um, you should really be careful in your evaluation that you can see every portion of your posterior annulus in the patient that you are planning for a cardioband procedure. So if you have um, an image quality like here on the right downside, the patient is supposedly not the best candidate for your cardioband. Moving to the right side and talking about tricuspid system, of course, we want to treat functional TR. It's the same um, compared to the left side, or at least functional dominant etiologies with annular dilatation. Presence of severe tethering um, or primary TR, of course, might inhibit good procedural results, and um, therefore severe tethering has been one of the major uh, exclusion criteria in, in the trial repair study. When talking about variables predicting procedural outcome, you have to keep in mind TR etiology, more than 90% are functional or mainly functional. You have to look out for severe tethering, talking about rheumatic diseases, for example. Um, you have to see and, and look for a large cooptation gap because as you have seen in the case before, um, patients with large cooptation gaps can be treated, but procedural results might be suboptimal or you might not be able to reduce TR to trace or, or mild. The jet orientation is, of course, of importance because it gives you a hint if TR might have some uh, primary um, problems there, and the ventricular function, talking about the right ventricle and geometry, is of course of importance as well. Grading TR severity is in this context very important. You have different um, parameters, echo parameters, qualitative and quantitative. 
Um, you've seen this slide or a slide compared to this uh, already, but I just want to share uh, this again with you because I think what initial experience with um, the catheter-based approach showed is that the regurgitation gap area ranges a lot wider than mitral regurgitation on the one hand and um, wider than classical parameters covers on the other. So patient might still have severe TR when assessed only with a vena contractor, although there is a relevant clinical improvement and a relevant TR reduction. So Rebecca Hahn uh, introduced this expansion of the severe grade, and if you call it massive or torrential or whatsoever, I think that's, that's not the thing that matters here, but the importance is that you can treat patients with more than severe TR, although you might not be able to reduce TR to mild in those patients, although you get a good or acceptable clinical and functional result. Presence of a pacemaker lead, we've heard about that. It is not a problem, but I mean, you can, um, you can um, erase the ideally a pacemaker lead must not impinge a tricuspid leaflet, thus causing TR being the reason for TR. Those patients are no um, cardioband candidates. And um, however, if there is a pacemaker lead present, you should be sure that you know where it is. And, and ideally, it's in the posterior septal commissure or in the middle of the valve, where it makes you know, problems uh, during your cardioband procedure. Annular calcification is, of course, something you should consider. However, it's far less frequent compared to the mitral space. Of course, it prevents optimal anchoring and cinching. If you have a large amount of calcium, it is a contraindication. I think that this is clear. And cardiac CT is, even for the tricuspid side, the best method of assessing calcification of the tricuspid annulus. Vessel proximity is another important thing, and it's the RCA. You've seen and heard that already. It is just important to have enough space for your four millimeter anchors here, and um, that uh, can be easily assessed with a pre procedural cardiac CT. You have the same sizes of cardio band uh, available for the tricuspid side. You can treat uh, an annulus of um, 120 millimeters at the max, and most of the patients um, that have been treated have received those larger cardio bands, of course, because tricuspid dimensions are usually a lot larger than the mitral space. And echo quality is, of course, of, of crucial importance as well. In the tricuspid space, you really have to be uh, sure that you can orientate yourself um, in, in the echo image. The coronary wire in the RCA helps to identify, of course, the tricuspid annulus, um, especially um, in the region of the first three to four anchors. It, it nicely follows the tricuspid annulus, so you have another modality that helps you to achieve a good um, implantation result in the end. So let me conclude for you. Take home message is, as always, patient selection is the key to procedural and functional success and good outcomes. So the right patient for cardioband systems should have, and doesn't matter if you screen for a mitral or a tricuspid cardioband here, good or very good TEE image quality. The etiology should be ideally pure functional or maybe mixed, but with functional dominance. Annular dilatation should be the main mechanism of regurgitation. If there is too much RV or LV um, yeah, a dysfunction and displacement involved, too much tethering, then the patient might not be the best candidate. So no leaflet tethering, no severe leaflet tethering, if possible. No or just minimal calcification. No pacemaker lead interference with the with the system or with um, tricuspid regurgitation etiology. And you have to have adequate space for anchors um, with no close vessel to the hinge point. That is uh, something very important to achieve a good cinching result, of course. And the patient should not have too severe RV or LV dysfunction. 
at least no CV pulmonary hypertension should be present for um, the treatment of patients with a tricuspid cardioband. I think that uh, Stefan von Badeleben has already addressed this question. And um, this is the last point, and I'm done. So thank you very much for your attention. Sir Robert, in fact, we thought we might use the time for a panel discussion at the end. So okay. if you come and join yeah. us, and uh, we'll include you in that discussion, of course. Um, the first question that we had in mind, and it actually reflects a question from one of our participants, relates to the right ventricle. And measurements of right ventricular function are, are difficult, even in the hands of experts. So which parameters of RV function would you use to determine baseline measurement and how can they determine longer term outcomes? Okay. So this is a very good question. And um, if I could choose, I would wish for cardiac MRI in each patient because I think that this is the gold standard for assessment of RV function so far on the one end, but on the other end, this is not feasible. So I think that we might have to stick to simple accessible parameters like TAPSI because this is a known parameter in, in different Speaking clinical subsets that predicts outcome for, for different uh, situations. So I think we sh might just should keep it simple. So I like that you mention MRI because every time we, we, we have the discussion, there is always somebody very scientific says that it's the gold standard, but we don't use it. So I would like to ask you, Maurice, mm. because uh, we have to be practical. So in your practice, when you have to decide to send a patient to, a, to, to surgery, for instance, which is a little bit more difficult decision, you know, you have to think twice, surgery is a bit more aggressive. So what is a single parameter that really drives you? Is there a, first of all, there, is there a single parameter or is a, or as usual, multi-parameter decision? It's a, it's a multi-parameter decision. Um, I don't like the patients who have a very bad RV uh, because they're going to go through a phase when you uh, eliminate the overload where the RV is going to be really bad. And so the immediate outcome after surgery can be worse. What will be interesting is to look at these patients with percutaneous treatment because when you do surgery, you have to stop the heart, you have an ischemic period, and the RV suffers Im immediately afterwards, whereas maybe with percutaneous, you don't have that phase, and maybe you could be more tolerant. So the RV, the uh, very severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, I think that the 60 to 65 threshold is a reasonable threshold, and and higher, if you want to treat TR, I would consider tricuspid valve replacement. And then, and then the comorbidity, because the patients that have like very bad uh, uh, renal function, they have reached so, so high a right atrial pressure that they have elevated creatinine 2.5, 2.9, um, they may go to dialysis afterwards if they survive. And so the, the, the range of comorbidities is very important. Uh, and, and that combination uh, uh, with the general state is, is are the factors that are looked for to say, okay, maybe, maybe here if we avoid this patient, we'll have a lower operative mortality. That's What is interesting is that uh, we've been running all together this uh, multi-device, multi-center trial, uh, trial uh, registry on tricuspid interventions. And different from surgery, actually, uh, interventions on isolated TR are reasonably low-risk procedures. Uh, I would not say there are no risk, zero risk, but compared to surgery, where it is standard to say more or less 40, 50 percent mortality for isolated TR in, 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 in end-stage patients, we have much lower mortality. Uh, I think a lot of this has to do with uh, what you just mentioned. These patients are multimorbid. They have multiple comorbidities. And, and what kills the patient for, with surgery is really the, just the inflammatory response of surgery, even if you don't stop the heart. It's beyond that. So really, I think uh, we will learn that tricuspid with these interventions way that we could not learn with, uh, with surgery. 
Azim. Francesco, maybe related to that, I mean, a lot of surgeons now say um, if it's isolated tricuspid valve surgery, a replacement can be done beating heart. So you avoid the insult from cardiopulmonary bypass. Does that make an impact? Is there data that makes an impact on mortality or morbidity? No. So wait, wait a second. Beating heart doesn't mean that you do without heartland machine. I mean, you have to go on a heartland machine and uh, you don't stop the heart. This is true. But it's amazing to see in this end stage patient, even if you don't have ischemia, the right ventricle suffers after this implantation. And I, my reading of this is really the, the inflammatory response on these patients are already borderline in met metabolic status. So uh, I think uh, there is a huge difference. And we have now some experience with uh, tricuspid replacement as well, and actually it's pretty well tolerated. So all this discussion about after the mismatch on the right side, I don't know. I think uh, there is a lot of confounding uh, elements which are deriving from surgery. Somebody who, has, uh, who gets, starts to be confused in this field and say, okay, there are no guidelines, guys, uh, patients with poor RV function, hypomyopression are recommended for medical therapy, so how do we decide at the end of the day? I mean, this decision making is very difficult. And, you know, and obviously, we know not so much about this, this procedure. We're still learning the, the mechanics of the procedure. So what do you think? How do we do? And, and therefore, how do yeah. we design these randomized trials? The other question. I, th I think we have several competing questions. First question is, is TR really related to poor prognosis? Um, as pointed out by some of the speakers, we don't completely know. It may be a, a mixture of confounders and TR may be just one of them, just a surrogate parameter. So we have to find this out. And we can only find this out if we have a treatment in our hand which safely interferes with TR. So if we have, let's say, a catheter-based approach with, which nicely reduces TR, then the next step would be to find out whether it is prognostically rele relevant. I think that's the only way to find out, really reliably out, that TR is driving poor prognosis, and that's where we are right now. Um, I'm repeating this over and over again. Right now, we are at feasibility. We're trying to find out, can we really tackle a tricuspid regurgitation? And, and the trials have to be done later. There will be a trial uh, probably for, the, for the, the cardioband. There will be certainly a trial, as we know, for the, for the clip with hard clinical endpoints and, and of course they have to be compared to uh, clinical, uh, good clinical therapy, medical therapy and then they have to look at the heart failure, rehospitalization and mortality. It's just the usual stuff. So just to go into this I would like to have one single answer from each one from the panel. So if you are convinced about the concept that treating TR is good for patients, what is the single parameter that convinces you, either uh, improvement of TR, uh, improvement of symptoms, uh, stroke volume improvement, uh, BMP, reversal in the inferior vena cava. Choose only one that is in your head, the one that really, I know that this will demonstrate that that works. So let's start from you, Georg. We, one, eh? First, we need to reduce TR. One? Yeah. TR, okay, for you it's TR. Just Reduction of TR, how much? Zero or? Not gonna be possible with the current devices uh, unless replacement, so let's say to moderate to mild. Okay. So, what about you, Robert? I would say um, um, improvement of patient's symptoms, and this is a... So you're more symptomatic? Yeah, I would think. I would and think symptom, so, which yeah. symptom would you pick? Difficult because yeah, it's very, very difficult, very subjective. Yeah. So maybe you should just leave it to the patient to decide if you improve. Don't even know whether the symptoms are related to TR, so that's why it's too yeah. soft. So, <laughs> Maurice, yeah. what do you pick? Come for on. For me, it would be uh, uh, procedural risk. Uh, the, the first criteria is low procedural risk. So risk would be important. What about you? Uh, yeah, I, I think see. of it from what would, what would I want for the primary endpoint of a randomized study, and I think probably heart failure hospitalization. Again, clinical. Yeah. So you see, you want to be mechanical, they're all clinical. No, 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 but that was not your question. Exactly. He just, My question he is... Didn't, he, did, he did not listen or not understand the question. <laughs> it's probably I, I a mixture, a mixture yeah, really of both. Yeah, yeah. He wants to go home. <laughs> no, but it would be. No, but what is, what, is the, what is the effect of 
your procedures that convinces you that one day you will get that answer? You know, what I is think it's an improvement in symptoms. Symptoms, yeah. okay. I'll also go for symptoms or physical activity for those patients. Then you, Bernard, and uh, close the session, please. Well, I'm going to go with the majority because that's always the safe place to be, and I'm going to say symptoms and quality of life. <laughs> So I'm going to draw the session to a close. It's been a, an enthralling and an entertaining and a compelling session regarding the strengths of uh, the emerging treatments for mitral and tricuspid valve intervention. Our speakers have demonstrated that these uh, disease entities are common and that they are increasing in their frequency in the years to come. We've seen a technical display of the cardioband device in both the mitral and the tricuspid uh, anatomy using mirror device technology, but a similar mechanism of action to effectively reduce annular dimensions and reduce the extent of regurgitation. I think we appreciate that the procedure remains technically challenging. At the moment, it's in the hands of very experienced experts but there's no doubt that it's propagation based upon the results of the six and 12 month outcomes you've seen presented uh, will be very compelling in the years to come. And finally, I think we've learned from Robert that very cl careful clinical and imaging screening is of fundamental importance to select these patients before onward referral to high volume centers with expertise in this sort of intervention. So I thank you very much for coming to the session and I encourage you to stay with us in the main arena for the closing live case of PCR London Valve 2018. Thank you very much.